Welcome to the channel. This week I watched the fantastic Apple TV show Bad Sisters and in this video we're going to talk about the pathophysiology of the sisters attempts at killing John Paul. Obviously a spoiler warning for the show but also a content warning as we're going to be talking about lots of ways you can be injured and potentially killed. We'll be focusing on the anatomy and the medicine behind it, not at all using it as a manual or recommendation in anyway. With that out of the way, in one of the first scenes we see a dead John Paul, so something ultimately worked. He is lying in wake and I don't know, can you be embarrassed when you're dead as he has an erection and this actually tells us the method of how he died. But before we reveal that, let's talk about the unsuccessful attempts. The Garvey sisters first plan to blow JP up is a gas explosion. Yep, that would probably do it. I say probably because there are a few things that could save you. The initial thing that's gonna cause you a problem is the blast wave, what we call a primary blast injury. This is the pressure change and shearing forces that in a mild form might burst your eardrums and in larger explosions would kill you instantly, usually from bursting your lungs, what we call blast lung or causing a traumatic brain injury or blood loss from ripping through your blood vessels and internal organs. So to survive this is kind of common sense. You want to hope for a low energy blast, so a small shock wave, and you want to be as far away as possible and not in an enclosed space. In this instance, it looks like a pretty significant blast and he's also in a very enclosed space. But he may well get some mitigation from the floors and walls between him and the blast. You also have potential of life-threatening injuries from objects being thrown from the blast onto you or even injuries from you being thrown into something, what we call secondary and tertiary blast injuries respectively. And if he somehow manages to get away with all these things, we also have smoke inhalation and burns. For example, if he's knocked out from the debris or even trapped somewhere, there's no one coming to help him anytime soon. So the smoke and heat would probably kill him in a few minutes. So all in all, a pretty decent plan, obviously foiled by the fact he wasn't actually in the house at the time of the explosion. We then see a less visually striking attempt at murder where the sisters tried to poison JP by spiking his dinner with metal digoxin. Initially, when they said they were injecting his liver, I literally thought they were gonna pin him down and inject it into his liver. But we find out they actually mean injecting the food, the liver, that he's gonna eat. Metal digoxin is the faster acting cousin of the drug digoxin, a very common drug in medicine. We use it every day in hospital and many people at home would be on it too. In its correct dose, it is positively ionotropic, so it makes the heartbeat stronger, and negatively chronotropic, so it makes the heartbeat slower giving the heart more time to fill. So it is commonly used in the treatment of heart arrhythmias, so irregular heartbeats such as atrial fibrillation. However, as with all things in life, you can have too much of a good thing and in high doses, it can cause all manner of symptoms, nausea, vomiting, headache, but what we really worry about is the heart going into a life-threatening arrhythmia. Because of the number of drugs we need to know about as doctors that people can potentially overdose on, there is a national poisons information service that doctors can look up. So in the case of cardiac effects of digoxin, it says this. Acute overdose usually causes a marked bradycardia, so that means a slowing of the heartbeat. Sinus arrest, so this means the area of the heart responsible for starting the heartbeat doesn't work. Varying degrees of AV block with dissociation or escape rhythm may occur. So this means the top chambers and bottom chambers of the heart no longer talk to each other. Hypotension may occur. So all these strange arrhythmias of the heart is obviously gonna affect how much cardiac output, how much blood, the heart can pump out, so this is gonna drop your blood pressure. In cases of severe toxicity, ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation may occur. So pulseless ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation are both cardiac arrest rhythms, so heart rhythms that are not compatible with life, and so this is ultimately how it kills you. And you may have heard digoxin poisoning in the media. Sadly, we know how lethal 
it can be as this was one of the poisons of choice for the serial killer and former nurse Charles Cullen. He used it to kill several patients who he was supposed to be caring for. And fans of James Bond movies may recall digoxin was the poison they used in Casino Royale where James Bond ends up having to defibrillate himself inside the car. Going back to the show, a comment by one of the sisters, Ursula, the nurse who actually gets hold of the drug from work, is that no one will suspect anything because they'll figure he's had a heart attack. Yeah, maybe the issue is the presentation is not going to be instant when ingested, meaning he'll have nausea and vomiting first, headaches, visual change, palpitations, which would give him time to get medical help and would hint that there's more going on, particularly if you get an ECG on while he's still alive, which wouldn't show a heart attack, but would show the changes we talked about previously, meaning you could potentially save him because a reversal agent exists digoxin specific antibody which binds to the drug or if he did sadly go on to die the presentation would be suspicious and that ECG would warrant a post-mortem which would surely pick up changes of digoxin. So all in all if the dose is high enough probably would have killed him but also probably would have got the sisters convicted of murder too. Next up definitely the most situational of all the attempted murders shooting someone via an old hole in their skull with a frozen paintball. Okay, so we know JP had a previous car accident and now has a hole in his skull. And although we don't know the full details, we can assume he's had a traumatic brain injury from the car crash and had a complication of intracranial bleed, so a bleed inside the skull. As the skull is a fixed bony container, any bleeding inside will increase the pressure, start to squash your brain, which will stop your brain from working. Put you into a coma and can ultimately kill you. So as an emergency a neurosurgeon will have to decompress the pressure inside the skull. There are different types of bleeds, some more urgent than others. All of them require different approaches but the principle of opening up the skull to relieve the pressure remains the same. In this instance we know that JP has been left with a burr hole so it's had part of his skull drilled out to relieve the bleed so it's likely he's had a chronic subdural bleed. This is one it's quite slow to form as it's a bleed in the venous system so much low pressure than that of an arterial bleed and usually these form days or weeks after a nasty head injury. I'm far from an expert on burr hole sites but looking up some basic neurosurgery here it looks like the x-ray shows the burr hole is in the parietal bone but JP actually feels for the hole here much lower down so if the sister BB is aiming for the site on the x-ray she probably would have missed anyway because this x-ray clearly isn't from JP. Going into this video, I hadn't ever thought about what happens to burr hole sites after the procedure. Do they heal over? Do you cover them somehow? Can you shoot someone directly with a frozen paintball into their brain? All these questions. And whenever we don't know as doctors, we can always get a consult. So my neurosurgical friend, but more importantly, my fellow graduate medic rugby player, Dr. Oscar, said this. Burr holes generally stay there for ages and never fully heal over. We sometimes use a metal burr hole cover for cosmesis, but it is rare. If a craniotomy, so any kind of hole in the skull in the past, then higher risk of traumatic brain injury with future head injury. So there you go, this method of murder, as mad as it sounds, actually makes some medical sense, although it's clearly very circumstantial and you'd think JP would be aware of his higher risk of brain injury, so it'd be wearing a helmet to play something like paintball. But either way, BB was aiming for the wrong burr hole site anyway, so he would have survived. We then give poisoning another go, so the aim this time is to drug JP with Rohypnol and leave him in the bath. This has every chance of working. Any kind of sedative can kill you. Basically, if you're so sedated that your body can't tell or react to the fact you can't breathe, and there are sadly plenty of people that have died swimming or even just in baths after taking sedatives, including just alcohol. And in fact, you don't even need to drown. You could be so sedated that you lose the muscle tone in your throat, blocking your own airway, 
and your consciousness may be so reduced that your body can't figure this out and you can suffocate that way, so-called swallowing your tongue. The drug they use though is a bit dubious. Rehypnol or flunitrazepam to give it its medical name is infamous as a date rate drug. Just like any benzodiazepine, it dampens down your brain activity, so sedates you and would stop you forming memories, hence it's varying amnesia effects. But what is odd is that in the show, they show that this drug is readily available in a cabinet on a hospital ward. Other benzodiazepines are far more accessible and would be on every hospital ward, like lorazepam used in seizures, diazepam used in anxiety or muscle spasms, and chlordiazepoxide used in alcohol withdrawal. But these are nowhere near as potent as rohypnol, so I understand why they chose this drug. However, rohypnol is a very specialist drug only used in the treatment of insomnia and even so is rarely used at all. It's actually blacklisted in the NHS, so we never use it. Obviously this is set in Ireland, so prescribing is gonna be slightly different, but either way, kept in a cupboard on a ward, that's just not gonna be realistic. If you wanted to prescribe it, you'd have to order it specifically for a patient and probably get higher up authorization from a name consultant too and that paper trial would not be conducive to a murder plan. Therefore, this plan is probably gonna get you foiled well before the drug gets close to the victim. Frozen to death in a freezer. There's just something very horror movie about this one. Hypothermia is absolutely something we see in the emergency department in the UK. For example, people passing out in the street under the influence of alcohol, People who are homeless in very cold weather or people drowning will often have a low temperature too. Being stuck in a walk-in freezer, yeah, not so much. Being in there long enough would obviously kill you, primarily from collapse to your circulation. So as you get cold, your body will constrict your peripheral blood vessels to prioritize your vital organ. This is why you get frostbite and if you survive you could lose your fingers and toes. This process puts more strain on your heart and once the core body temperature drops further, the heart can start to slow and go into life-threatening arrhythmias which would ultimately kill you. Whilst this is going on, your brain is very sensitive to the effects of temperature too, so it will start to lose the ability to function, you become confused, you'd get strange behaviors like foot stomping or people may start getting undressed which would obviously make things worse and ultimately you'd slip into a coma and then shortly followed by death. I told you this was a pretty gruesome one. Thankfully, the show doesn't show the horrific last moments of JP's mum. Calling them bad sisters is really underplaying the pain that she would have gone through. One thing I would add though, a little bit of extra insider knowledge. As a kid, I worked in a jam factory with several of these walk-in freezers and they all had a big red button on the door on the inside which would open even if the freezer was locked from the outside. It's actually a legal requirement too. So definitely this plan of locking someone in a freezer would work as you saw with JP's mother, but in reality, they'd be able to easily get out via that big red button. And finally, they got him, or actually it's his wife Grace that ends up doing the dirty deed as JP is strangled. Strangulation can kill you in two ways, either a blood choke or an air choke, but either held long enough will stop blood and oxygen getting to the brain and therefore kill you in just a few minutes. A blood choke would cut off the circulation to your brain, so compress the carotid arteries. This would render you unconscious in a matter of seconds. An air choke would compress the windpipe, stopping air getting into your lungs and therefore to the blood and to the brain. And this would take a couple of minutes, as you know, as you can hold your breath for a fair amount of time, but less time when you're physically moving and panicking as we see here. And as we said at the beginning of the video, we could have worked out this method of death from the fact he had an erection after death, what we call a death erection or angel lust, and is pretty much specific to strangulation. I say pretty specific as there are other things that could cause it, so from Wikipedia here. Other causes of death may also result in these effects, including fatal gunshots to the head, 
damage to major blood vessels and violent death by poisoning. And so there you go, some of my thoughts on the pathophysiology and the medicine of the murders of the brilliant show Bad Sisters. If there's anything I've missed or you have any questions or any other shows you want me to check out, then leave a comment down below. And as always, thank you so much for your support on the channel. If you did like this video, give it a like and consider subscribing. I hope you're all well at home and I'll be back soon.